Okay. So today I would like to have another look at this beautiful book here. It's on 1000 Design Classics. So if you saw the first video that I made with this book, it was more in a role play style. Today I would like to just page through it and casually look at some of the designs. So some of these we already saw and I noticed that it seems to be in chronological order somewhat. I think I only went through the first um, 20 or so pages. So there's so many, there's so many beautiful things. Pictures. So I really don't know where I want to start. Remington number one typewriter. That's from eighteen sixty eight. We did get into this far last time. I think that's where we stopped. developed without a crossbar to enable ease of mounting while wearing a skirt. Okay, classic knife set, 1886. P 
Peter um, Barenz trained as a painter but became a highly successful industrial designer Um, so Behrens, Behrens reduced the number of objects that comprise a traditional service, omitting objects such as decanters, jugs, and finger bowls, designing instead 12 different sized glasses. He also simplified the design by removing all surface decorations such as etching, engraving, carving, or enameling. Okay, let's see if we have the paper clip. The music salon chair. Okay, cafe museum chair folding director's chair, moving into 1900. We have the opaque globe pendant lamp from 1900. And the honey swivel stick from the 1900s as well. Uh -huh. We have the mirrored ball from the 1900s. Shiny. Very pretty picture there. So, designer unknown. The disco became the common name for the dance hall from the early 1960s, but it was not until the 1970s that the scene really found its identity. The poster for the film Saturday Night Fever provides an enduring image of the phenomenon with John Travolta in his flared white suit under a mirrored ball, a fixture that was the epitome of nightclub chic and a staple effect for any self-respecting disco. However, it had graced the ceilings of dance halls for many years Prior, it is said to have appeared in the United States as early as 1910 and fe uh, featured in the 1942 classic Casablanca. Very beautiful. We have the brownie camera from 1900, and here we have a garden chair, 1900. Aha, uh -huh. we have the peacock chair, which was recognizable to many. Uh, seems like it was so popular in the 80s. Everyone had a picture in this chair. But it's from the 1900s, early 1900s. It says, although it is thought to have originated um, at least as far back as the early 20th century, the peacock chair, so-called because of the broad, intricately woven rattan back that resembles the tail of that exotic bird, it is considered by many a symbol of the 1970s, popularized by portraits of figures such as the Black Panther co-founder Huey P. Newton. Um, the peacock became a ubiquitous motif on album artwork such as Al Green's I'm Still in Love with You in 1972 throughout the decade. However, little is known about its design origins. Artisans in Southeast Asia were the first to produce furniture using rattan, and as early as the 17th century, 
woven rattan known as wicker had been imported to Europe. Okay. Meccano. Don't know what that is. And the Eastwood. Heard of that? Meccano, M E C C A N O, um, with its rationalist design and engineered precision. Inventor Frank Hornby's Meccano, or Messano, I would think Meccano, was originally based on fifteen prefab elements that included perforated strips and plates of tin simply pieced together with nuts and bolts rendered at various times over the century in tin and nickel plate featuring bold primary colors and in kits with different themes Meccano was the 20th century's archetype Typo construction toy. Okay, never heard of that before. So it's little toys here, you can see. Little construction type toys. Okay. We have the Calvet chair. 1902. There. And these chairs. Hill House ladder back chair. And then here we have a teddy bear. Just says bear 55 PB 1902. Richard Steiff. Of all the objects to emerge from Germany's industrial age, the Steiff made teddy bear 55 PB is perhaps the only one uh, to be universally loved. Invented by Richard Steiff, the nephew of company founder Margaret Steiff. It was inspired by his sketches of the bears at the zoo. As, um, uh, its appearance at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 increased the item's popularity, which became aligned in the popular imagination with U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, who, despite being a hunter, allegedly spared a bear cub during a shooting party. And this uh, served uh, to launch a thousand teddy bear imitators. And it says, uh, leading Steiff to brand its creation with a hallmark brass button in its left ear. A tradition that continues to this day. And we have a coffee set. It's pretty. It's white and red there. I'm going to want to read about everything. Uh, 1901, 1902. Here we have Crayola crayons. 1903. From Edwin Binney and Harold Smith. Crayola Crayons is the world's most recognizable brand in its category. In 1903, co-inventors and cousins um, set out to create a set of colorful crayons that were safe for use in schools. Alice Binney, Edwin's wife, named the crayons Crayola from the French words for chalk and oily. Um, the first 
first set cost a nickel and was introduced in 1903 with eight colors. Red, blue, yellow, green, purple, orange, brown, and black. Okay. We have the um, Fortuny Moda Lamp. The Perkersdorf chair. Here, this is a Diabolo, one of those toys, the very old toy, 1904. The Diabolo is a circus game made from two cast rubber domes joined in the middle with a metal axle. By spooling a length of string, Around the axle, the, the Diabolo can be spun and propelled into the air, caught on its return, and used to perform a series of gravity-defying tricks. You can see the images there of the boy doing lots of tricks. I guess it's a bunch of different boys, <laughs> all wearing the same outfit. We have the flat model, the la boule blue. What is that? It's a game. Okay, nineteen oh four. It's a game that you play. I never heard of it before. Modern game of bulls. B o u l e s. We have a fruit bowl, 1904, early product of the Weiner or Wiener um, Werkstatt, launched in 1903. Okay, the Caterpillar tractor. 1904. Benjamin Holt, a peat farmer in the southern United States, realized the enormous economic potential of a vehicle capable of working in the soft, spongy local soil that could not support horses or the heavy, steam-driven, wheeled tractors then available. He began testing his first steam-powered wheeled vehicle with two continuous wooden tracks on his land in 1904. Okay. Okay. We have the Santos wristwatch and the armchair for the Post, post, sparkas. Don't know what that means. Oh, here we have the water lily table lamp. It's beautiful. Pretty, pretty lamp. We have the sits machine. What is that? Looks like a weird uh, chair. <laughs> Sorry, that's the um, thing going off outside. Okay, so the Stitz machine or the sitting machine was designed by leading Viennese designer of the early 20th century. Every part of the chair was created to tell us that it was machine-made and that, in fact, we are to regard it as a machine itself. Okay. We have the Adirondack chair. It's pretty. They're still very popular. The 
model number 371 lots of different chairs continental silver cutlery Dixie cups 1908 the spreading of communicable diseases spawned vaccines and motivated the creation of the individual paper cup in the late 19th century. Okay. People drank water from a shared tin dipper in public places, an unhygienic practice only abolished in the United States in 1909. A few years earlier, invented a paraffin treated paper cup to address this health problem. So it comes from 1908 and the cut stand 1908. We have the Ford Model T 1908 car there. The monoplane. I think we read about this maybe in the um, Maybe the 20th century book, because I remember that name. The Blario Monoplane. Yes, we did read about that. Neon Gas Light, 1910. Still use those. Let's see. In 1912, two years after French engineer and chemist George Cloud presented his improved neon lamp. Uh, the first neon sign was sold to a barber in Paris. The idea, a simple, oh, I'm sorry, the idea is simple. A high voltage passes through a bent glass tube containing neon or another suitable inert gas at low pressure and light is produced. Neon emits a red glow, but using other gases, colored tubes, and phosphor coatings ensure a variety of colored lights can be created. Here we have the clipless stand paper fastener, 1910. This is the Cubis armchair. Star. Type of boat. The binder clip. That's from 1911. Okay, so we'll see those everywhere. Here we have set a camera plowable machina. It's a type of camera. And in nineteen twelve, Chester armchair and sofa. Series B glassware. Zip fastener, 1913. Uh, like something was that, like the zipper was originally intended for use on shoes. Okay, then we have the dinghy, this little boat here, 1913. The Dixon Ticonderoga Pencil, which we still use today. It's popular for school. 1913. In, in 1860, most people still wrote using quills. Okay. And then this company, Joseph Dixon Crucible Company, started producing pencils. 
we have the original Seeger can opener. The Nonic pint glass. And the number 20 AL desk stand. Said a phone, bell telephone. Western Electric Company right there. Very cool looking. We have a folding stool, 1914. And Pyrex, 1915. The most significant features of Corning's Pyrex range are its design and its material which both remain unchanged. It's a heat-resistant glass used in its manufacture made its function possible. As most glass, for instance, cannot tolerate significant or rapid temperature changes because it expands on heating, inevitably leading to fracture. The Tunnel Mailbox, 1915. Let's see. It was um, originated as a model to standardize United States mail delivery on rural routes. Um, at that time, mailboxes were homemade usually from some sort of discarded container slapped onto a pole. And in 1901, the United States Postal Service created a commission for the standardized mailbox. We have the Classica water bottle. Uh, the fo Foker or Fokker DR1 triplane. The tank wristwatch and the red and blue armchair. Wooden spoons, 1919. The history of wooden spoons dates back to around 1000 BC in Egypt. They were still being used in the early 17th century when they were listed on the inventories of early settlers of America. Traditionally, such spoons were hand-carved from indigenous woods, and after the Industrial Revolution, companies realized that they could be mass-manufactured and exported. Raw Plugs, John Rawlings, 1919. For as long as threaded screws have existed, time and effort has been devoted to the problem of how to fix them securely into substances. Notably, plasterboard and masonry and reinforced concrete. Just before World War I, building contractor John J. Rawlings was working at the British Museum, where officials asked that he fix screws to the walls, damaging the masonry as little as possible. As a res result, he could not use the commonplace method of fixing, whereby screws were driven into blocks of wood tightly fitted into relatively large holes. His answer was a fabric plug the length of the threaded section of screw, which had a hollow core. Made from coarse fiber such as jute, jute or hemp, it was bonded with glue or even animal blood. A hole the diameter of the screw was drilled in the masonry and the plug inserted. The screw was then screwed into the plug, which
which gripped tightly against the sides of the hull. He named his invention the raw plug, patented it, and in 1919 established the raw plug company to manufacture his product. We have the brown Betty teapot. Cute. And the soda fountain tumbler. Very common style cup today. We have the push can, 1920s. And pitcher, beautiful, number 432. It's a beautifully shaped. of these taxis streaming down its avenues. Uh, John D. Hertz founded the Cab Management Company, Yellow Cab, in 1915, recycling used cars as taxis, and he chose yellow after reading that it was the easiest color to see from far away. AGA Stove, 1922. Indian Chef, 1922. It's a motorcycle. Over here, this is a screen. from hat designer Madame Matthew Levy for an apartment interior on Rue de Lota in Paris it was a milestone for the Irish-born designer Eileen Gray. Explore her distinct aesthetic on an architectural scale. The heart of her design was a screen made of 450 small panels each painstakingly created in matte gray lacquer with gold and silver highlights stretching through the apartments. <laughs> Just a brick length. Okay. We have the hanging lamp and here a toy Bauhaus bow spiel and the yo-yo 1923 and another toy the spinning top 1923 and the yo-yo was made by Donald Duncan BMW R32 motorcycle design here. The MT8 table lamp. Okay, the chess set, 
ago in coffee houses in Germany and Switzerland, but became forever associated with the Viennese coffee house culture in Austria. Um, let's see. Some have two um, wing nut screws at either end which open to allow a small gap, and others have a hinge at one end so that one side opens. Okay. This camera here, the Leica One. had made his fortune bottling and distributing Coca-Cola, Raymond Brown would have been familiar with one of the main drawbacks of glass containers. They chip and break, especially while being opened. When a failed attempt to manufacture recording equipment left him with some spare factory capacity, he offered it to Thomas C. Hamilton, who had developed a wall-mounted bottle opener that was guaranteed not to chip the bottleneck. Hamilton's opener consisted of a small plaque with a hole for it to be screwed to the wall. Over this was an eyelid-like hood that gripped the outer edge of the bottle cap. The bottle was inserted under the hood and then pushed towards the vertical. And we know how that works. <laughs> and let's see, the hood provided a perfect eye level space for branding. And over the years, the logos and devices embossed onto the opener have included beer and soda companies, patriotic imagery, college sports teams, proverbs, witticisms, and the simple instruction, open here. Okay, then we have the Wassily chair, and I So then, over here is a martini glass, that's from 1925. Here is a 1027 day bed, that's from 1925. Okay, um, cast iron cookware, La Crusette. And I don't know how to say that. Lockio table. Lock 
you or lost you. It's like those kind of stackable tables. Let's see over here. It's a Bauhaus cocktail shaker. Tea and coffee service. Here is a bibendum chair. Okay, here is pyramid cutlery. This is a high felly one seven nine zero chair. Wonder why they name them with these numbers. And a tea caddy, nineteen twenty six. Since this cylindrical tea caddy is simple in form, yet it invites the user to partake in the ritual of tea drinking. And a hairpin, or I call them bobby pins. Let's see if it says why. Anything about bobby pins. The hairpin from 1926. Um, the hairpin or hair grip or bobby pin in the United States is a simple utility design of which many different versions are still produced. Its brilliance is that it is made from one piece of material with no open-close mechanism. Its resilient, thin and flexible metal, now usually plastic coated, is bent round, so the longer straight base, um, straight base leg lies directly beneath a crimped upper leg. And its success is enduring. Usage is in the balance it creates between space and compression, flexibility and grip, allowing the pin both to be secure and be removed easily with minimal damage to the hair shaft. I use these every single day for my hair. It's so simple. Club chair. This is the um, another watch, oyster wristwatch. This just says 833. <laughs> it's like a chair, but why are they all? Oh, I'm sorry, not 8B33. All the chairs are named by number. This plane here, Lockhead Vega. The adjustable table. 1027 Frankfurt Kitchen. Not sure what that means. 1927. The Frankfurt Kitchen represents one of the earliest attempts at creating a truly efficient domestic space. Driven by the ideal of providing good design within mass housing. It pioneered the use of standardized, low-cost, prefabricated elements in what was arguably the first fitted kitchen. Okay. I see. Here is the tube light. The MR10 and MR20 chairs. Another chair here. Grand Comfort Armchair. It's nice and puffy chair. Let's see the Candom Table Lamp. The LC6 Table. Dinette Tea Set. And the LC4 Chaise Lounge. That looks nice. Looks very modern. 1928. 
the now familiar outline of the Le Corbusier LC4 Chaise Lounge, model B306, dates from 1928. The H-shaped base down here, and separate seating element with hide upholstery and head cushion are inherently linked with high design interiors. Okay, like it. Then there is the um, LC1 basculant chair, the Sandos or Sandows chair. It's pretty cool looking. Beach chair, but it's metal. Um, the Rolleiflex six by six. It's a camera. It's pretty cool looking. I like that picture. The picture of the camera. Okay, we have the double lever corkscrew. And the B32 chair, looks like an old kitchen chair. The Sunbeam Mixmaster, I think we still see those, that brand. Sunbeam is still popular. And the Thonet number 8751, this looks like a regular uh, folding chair. Producing ready-made furniture. We have this um, Tugan Tugan Dot coffee table. The Dragon porcelain tea service and the drinking set number two forty-eight. Loose. This is the Barcelona chair, 1929. Also looks nice and comfy. Lots of different chairs. This looks pretty cool. The ST14 chair, 1929. The BRNO chair. The Hindenburg. Okay, 1929. Let's see. Um, starting service in 1936, the LZ 129 Hindenburg operated for a year, undertaking 60 voyages before it exploded at its mooring. Filled with highly explosive hydrogen because helium was banned. Its origins date to 1900 when Zeppelin invented the rigid airship, uh, developing a spindle shaped aerodynamic form through numerous designs that culminated in the Hindenburg. The largest airship in history. Its remarkable shape, honed by extensive wind tunnel testing, marked the pinnacle of aerodynamic research, using an aspect ratio of 6 to 1, length to width, optimal to lower the drag coefficient. It was constructed from longitudinal fabric strips over a metal frame. Its structural volume was about 250,000, is that meters cubed, of fuel and approaching 200 tons fully laden. And it carried interior gas tanks within the outer skin that provided buoyancy. Four diesel engines powered 4,400 HP horsepower 
giving a top speed of 135 kilometers per hour, um, while a suspended two-floored gondola of over 400 meters squared, designed by Berlin architect Fritz August uh, Bruhaus de Groot, housed passengers. The Nazi government uh, rejected Bauhaus modernism, but the need for lightweight uh, furnishings led the regime to allow the interior to feature metal-framed furniture and a specially designed lightweight metal piano. Its ultimate destruction ended commercial transatlantic airship flights. Then here we have the jewel grip stapler. We Wheeler's scooter. It's cute, 1930. The propeller folding stool. Over here, best light. Light a lamp. This looks very old. It's an armchair. It's kind of strange. That looks like very basic compared to the others from before it. Okay, the bar stool, nineteen thirty. in the 1930s, designers became preoccupied with rationalization and standardization, and these concepts were brought to life in the form of storage systems and furniture designs that used new materials and technologies, thereby defining the interior spaces in which they were housed. This one just says chair, 1930. Not sure why. Looks like all little springs. It has the seat in the back. Here, the um, Scheibenhenkel tea service, 1930. It's a pretty color. It's kind of Unique looking, the handle there. The queen kitchen scale. Stacking chairs. Up there is a glass teapot. It's very pretty. And form. 1382 dinner service. The Reverso wristwatch. Armchair 41 Paimio. Very unique designs with all of the different chairs, I think. It's from 1932. Pressed glass up here. And Isa Gonali glassware. This is a Fontana table or Fontana. 1932. It says glass has always played an important role in the work of Italian furniture and lighting company Fontana. Art, and nowhere is this better illustrated than in Pietro, uh, either Chiesa or Chiesa's um, Fontana table of 1932. So simple. 
He was fascinated by the properties of this fluid, versatile material. He utilized a number of techniques, including cutting, molding, and grinding to design a range of furniture, lamps, and objects using glass. Here's an Omega drawing pin. What is that? The provenance of this unpretentious little drawing pin is quickly established. A Swiss maid reads the engraving stamped into the top of the thumbnail sized pinhead. There. The head sits atop three sharp pins cut with one edge straight and one slanted, which comes to meet at a sharp point. Architects have been using Omega pins since the late 1940s. The design has remained unchanged since it was patented by A. Schild S.A. of Grenchen, Switzerland. Okay, then we have the M.K. folding chair. The Calatrava wristwatch. The, I don't know if you say Echo or E-K-C-O, AD-65 Bacalite Radio. It says in the early 1930s, the average radio, typically wooden, large, heavy, and expensive, looked more like a piece of household furniture than state-of-the-art technology. Okay. And this shelf, I guess? Oh no, it's a chair. <laughs> it's another chair. Such kind of crazy designs with these chairs. People really liked um, getting creative with furniture, I guess. This is the zigzag chair. Looks like something from way after the 1930s. Okay, the stool, number 60. The Hermes baby. What is that? This, um, the unobtrusive outline of the Hermes baby typewriter. Oh, it's a typewriter. Looks instantly familiar, being the model for many designs that followed. The first truly portable typewriter. It was small, lightweight, and inexpensive. And its success was ensured with it becoming a favorite among journalists and reporters. Designed by Giuseppe um, Prezioso for the Swiss firm Ernest Pilard and Sai, named after the Greek god of travel and commerce. Hmm. 1932. The Mickey Mouse wristwatch. That's cute. 1933. Here is. What is that? An egg coddler. Okay, deck chair. A chaise lounge. have the Zippo lighter. It's probably familiar to lots of people. 1933. The Zippo lighter is legendary, retaining its credibility and remaining virtually unchanged since its origins in 1933. The Zippo 
made its reputation in World War II when the United States government ordered the entire production for Army and Navy issues. It reportedly deflected potentially fatal bullets, acted as a signaling device in rescue operations, and even heated soup in upturned helmets. Well, okay. This is a bent plywood armchair. This is a illuminator floor lamp. There is a Dymaxion car. What is that? The only Dymaxion car in existence. The second of three prototypes is in the National Auto Museum in Reno, Nevada. Uh, U.S. designed in the early 1930s. The three-wheeled, um, six-meter streamlined capsular car carried 11 passengers at 192 kilometers per hour with a 90 horsepower engine. Okay, pencil sharpener here. That's cool. The Mocha Express coffee maker. Here is a um, Hyperbo 5RG radio, Chrysler Airflow, here at this car. We have, um, cold Spot Super 6 in a fridge. And here is the um, Douglas DC. Three aircraft. Oh, let's see this small little plane right here. It says uh, just four years after its first flight in 1935, uh, DC threes were carrying 90% of the world's airline traffic. During the decade, passenger airline travel was subsidized by government mail contracts in the United States, and there was a need for a profitable passenger plane with sufficient range and payload, with enough comfort to attract passengers. The Linhoff Technica. Is that how the camera looks like? Looks like a very old school camera, but uh, I guess it's kind of pulled apart there. And this is another boat, the J Class Yacht Endeavor to race bigger boats in the America's Cup. The universal rule was introduced in 1929, and yachts with a waterline length between 22.8 and 26.5 meters could race in what was called the J-Class. Is I don't know how to say it. I'm guessing Bugatti Type 57. It's a crazy looking car. 1934. The Bugatti Type 57 played a crucial role in the history of one of the great car manufacturers. Sorry, manufacturers. Until 1934, the Bugatti had made a different chassis for every body type, making it an, an expensive way to build cars. 
This changed with the Type 57 industrialized approach, creating a chassis to fit with various body styles. Okay, and here is the Supermarine Spitfire. 1934. Let's see how far we can get in this book. Um, the standard chair. Okay. Standard chair, 1934. And here is the Lola brush. That's cool. 1934. A staple addition to any German work top. The Lola brush is one of those understated items that people take to their hearts. Hmm. The Lola is as coveted for its familiar form as it is for its function of washing vegetables or dishes. The circular wooden head which is connected to a slender arm by a metal clasp. This not only allows for a certain freedom of movement, but also means that the head can be easily detached. The brush is efficient, agile, and hard-wearing. Its design has required no updating. The Lola brush available today is manufactured using the same blueprint as those first produced in 1934. The product still bears its logo, the original logo, which is a great example of German graphic design. Okay, then we have Service 501. He said here, tea and coffee set. There is the classic red wagon, number 18, radio flyer from 1934. And here is this, uh, looks like a video recorder, the Bolex H16. It was designed by Jacques um, Bogopolsky, a Ukrainian engineer living in Geneva. In 1924, he patented a movie camera using 35mm film, the Bol Cinegraph. His attention then turned to 16mm film and the Auto Cine the first camera produced under the Bolex name. Um, it was given a turret holding three lenses that could be rotated as required. Okay. Here is a Normandy picture, 1935. It's pretty and an ice cream scoop, 1935. And this is by the Zeril Ice Cream Sc Ice Cream Scoop. It's a beautiful object. Elegant, shiny, and sculptural. Its design is perfect for its task, and thus it has remained unchanged since it first came on the market in 1935. Sorry, in 1935. At that time, ice cream was changing from being a luxury product into one that was widely available thanks to advances in freezing technology. However, ice cream fresh from the freezer is often very hard and scraping it from its tub with a spoon is difficult. Sherman L. Kelly's innovation which is literally at the heart of the Zeril scoop, is a hollow handle core that contains antifreeze. Oh, this antifreeze conducts body heat 
from the scooper's hand and delivers to it to the blade of the scoop, helping it to cut a path through the ice cream. I never knew that. Seems a little strange. This is the angle poise 1227 lamp. The model number 21 chair. And a T trolley 901. Um, the Juso mat, the armchair 400, or the tank chair, looks comfy, the vacuum cleaner 1936. By the 1920s, when vacuum cleaners were becoming more common, anxieties grew around dust accumulating in the home and anything that might contain germs. Thus, when James Spangler devised his motor-driven upright vacuum cleaner in 1907, from which William Henry Hoover developed the first commercial model in 1908, the principal selling point had been on healthy respiration and the expulsion of germs not on any labor-saving benefits. Early vacuum cleaners were highly industrial-looking machines. Henry Dreyfus, who had started to work for Hoover in 1934, realized these limitations when designing the Model 150, helping the company to capitalize not only on a health and hygiene message, but also on a widespread desire for a vacuum cleaner that reflected the technological advances of the age. It's easier to carry. It's kind of beautiful, actually. <laughs> There's a story that I had seen about a boy uh, that liked to collect vacuum cleaners. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. He's grown up now, but it's kind of cool. That one does look really neat looking. The Fiat 500A Topolino. What is this? Fiesta Wear 1936. The uh, Kodak Bantam Special. 36 Post office kiosk K6 It's also called The Jubilee Kiosk Sir Giles Gilbert Scott An architect whose buildings include London's Battersea Power Station And Waterloo Bridge won a three-way competition in 1929 to, de to design a mass-produced, standardized telephone kiosk to use in Britain. Okay. The Airstream Clipper, 1936. Guess I'll have to stop the video pretty soon. This is the Riga or Re Riga Minox camera. Oh, it's tiny. And then the, um, up, what does that say? Aprilia 1936. The Lancia Aprilia, one of the first commercially successful streamlined cars. And the Harley Davidson. 1936. Known as the mother of the modern motorcycle, the Harley Davidson EL was in many ways the prototype 
of all later Harley Davidsons. In 1931, Harley Davidson decided to develop a completely new bike. Um, when the EL model came out five years later, with an up-to-date transmission and frame, it established Harley-Davidson as America's leading motorcycle producer, and it was especially noted for the modern overhead valve design that became the engine of the future. Okay. So I think Harley-Davidson is a good place to end the video. I wish I could really just spend hours flipping through the whole book. And I think it's pretty interesting. So maybe we'll be able to take another look at this later on. So we'll stop the video here. And, um,. I hope that you enjoyed, and I hope that you'll be looking forward to the next one. Okay, so thank you so much.